All right, we're gonna get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, before we begin, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're virtually meeting today and where I'm personally joining from, uh, which would be the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, on behalf of Digital Rights Watch and Twitter, I'd like to welcome you all to our roundtable discussion on online anonymity and why it matters. Uh, before we kick off, I'll just share a few little housekeeping uh, tidbits. We are recording the session and it will be on the record. Um, to help keep things streamlined, we're just asking if you're not a speaker to keep your cameras off and microphones on mute until the end. And then when we have the Q&A, of course, you can turn them on. Um, we will have time for questions at the end, um, but if you'd like to ask any questions during the discussion, if something pops into your head, um, feel free to drop it into the chat function. And um, Ben, um, who's our Twitter head of comms and is on the call, can collate them for the panel at the end. All right, so on to the purpose for today. Um, the reason that we've convened this round table is because we've seen the debate around anonymity spike in Australia in recent weeks. And we're seeing a conflation of the issues in the public debate. We wanted to make sure that we convened a group of people who are experts in their respective fields to clarify and discuss the issues as well as answer your questions. Um, we are privileged today to be joined by some incredible guests and lineup. So today's speakers are going to include Professor David Kay, former UN Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of opinion and expression. We also have Peter Grest, who's the director of the Alliance for Journalist Freedom and a professor at the University of Queensland and UNESCO Chair in Journalism and Comms. We have the amazing Lucy Krahultova, Executive director, director of Digital Rights Watch. We have Adrienne Murdoch, who's a Partnerships and Campaigns Coordinator at Minus 18. We have Dr. Emily Vandernagel from Monash University. And then of course myself, Kara Hinesley, and I'm the Director of Public Policy at Twitter for Australia and New Zealand. So, each of our guests are gonna speak for about five minutes to share about how anonymity relates to their respective subject matters, experiences and work. And then we're gonna open up the floor to all of you for questions at the end. So I will hand over to David now to kick us off. Over to you, David. Great, thanks Kara. And it's really great to, um, I guess, <clears throat> at least see the people I can see right now. Um, as Kara suggested, uh, you know, for six years, I was the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression. And in that, um, in that capacity, I thought about issues of online speech uh, through the lens of international human rights law. So in the few minutes that I have, I thought I would just lay out that framework so that we have a little bit of a sense of not only why anonymity or pseudonymity um, might be important, but also why they're guaranteed by human rights law. Um, and, and in fact, uh, there, um, there's a history of more or less explicit um, uh, recognition that freedom of expression includes the freedom to speak, to seek, receive, impart information and ideas um, anonymously. So, so let me just start with what that framework is. So, the, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which echoes the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, um, but it also is a treaty uh, to which Australia is a party, uh, as an example, and about 170 countries are parties to the ICCPR. Article 19 of the covenant protects everyone's right, among other things, everyone's right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers and through any media. You know, as, as an American, so coming from a, a constitutional First Amendment environment that, you know, basically says Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech or of the press, I actually find Article 19 more robust and in some ways more inspiring, right? Because, you know, it, it first of all, frames the right to freedom of expression as something that everybody enjoys. It's not merely a limitation on state action. It's actually a statement about what individuals enjoy. And then it's also written, you know, it was adopted in 1966. The language is practically designed for a digital age, right? I mean, today, instead of seek, receive, and impart, you might think, 
you know, browse, download, and post, or something like that. It's a robust statement of freedom of expression, and and that's that's where I start in my work, and that's where I wanted to start in in just referencing uh, the rights today, and as we think about anonymity. Now, the next paragraph, Article 19, Paragraph Three, of the of the Covenant, tells us when uh, states can restrict that freedom of expression. But but it's an, it provides for a narrow set of restrictions, and what it says is that a state or a public authority, often we could think about this in terms of you know the the you know major technology companies too. But in thinking about states, states may only restrict freedom of expression where it meets what we think of as a three part test, and that test is one uh, what we call legality, which is whether the restriction is provided by law. So in other words, is the restriction precise enough, narrow enough? Does it provide guidance? Does it limit what the state can do? The restriction must be necessary and proportionate, and it must be aimed to protect specific legitimate interests of the state, which are identified as protecting the rights or reputations of others, national security or public order, or public health or morals. Now, you know, I'm a law professor, so I've kind of uh, lectured enough here right now. The thing I want to highlight here is that Article 19 demands that the government demonstrate that any particular restriction meets those three tests, right? That it meets the criteria of Article 19. And when we think about anonymity, I want us to think about it in, in two sets of ways. One is that anonymity clearly is a way in which people um, seek and receive and impart information. We know this from centuries of experience. And, you know, it's very easy to say since time immemorial. But we do know that uh, anonymous speech, certainly in the development of democratic societies, has been essential to public debate. It's been essential to individual human development in repressive societies the ability to seek information or receive information in a kind of you know cone of privacy if we want to think of it like that under the the blanket of anonymity has allowed people historically to explore their heritage to explore their sexual orientation their gender identity and we could go on and on and anybody could come up with examples where um, you know a failure of anonymity right a publicity of one's persona might lead to real harm. So in that context, it's a, it's critical that the state demonstrate the absolute necessity of, um, of undermining anonymity in any particular circumstance. Um, now, this is not to say that there may be circumstances when anonymity does meet those tests. But generally speaking, um, in, in my experience, from seeing the way in which states and you know we could have another discussion about private actors undermining anonymity has rarely been shown to be necessary in the circumstances and has often been shown to be um, a, a kind of interference based on illegitimate purposes for example a desire to find out who's criticizing you and so uh, as we think about anonymity i think one of the things to think about is the structure of rights the rights that anonymity protects, the privacy and security that attach to anonymity, uh, and, um, and in particular, the demands that we might uh, want to impose upon states or other major actors seeking to, uh, to interfere with the right. I'll stop there. I saw Benjamin's hand. And thank you very much for, uh, for hearing me. Thanks, David, for setting that out, especially from the global context. Um, so I'll jump in here to speak on behalf of Twitter and talk a little bit about how this relates from a company context. Um, so we, of course, understand <clears throat> that there's a number of pressures driving Internet regulation around the world, which is wide ranging. And these challenges are going to affect platforms of all sizes. But most importantly, it's going to impact the ability of billions of people to share information um, around the world on the Internet. And 
a lot of these international contexts and um, points that, that David was um, referencing are underpinning the way that we're looking at um, preserving anonymity online. As I mentioned earlier, we've seen the political debate here in Australia around anonymity um, really spike. And we're seeing this idea put forward that removing anonymity is gonna solve the problems of online abuse. But we believe that clamping down on anonymous accounts will fail to deal with the problems of online abuse and actually could damage the people who rely on anonymity and pseudonymity online. When um, we're thinking through this thing, there's actually kind of three points to keep in mind when we're framing out the issue. Um, the first would be that anonymity can be a form of protection and a critical tool for people. The second would be that evidence, evidence is overwhelmingly pointing to anonymity bans being ineffective. And third, we have concerns that the erosion of these principles would stifle free speech and democratic debate. So to the first point around anonymity being a form of protection, um, I, I think that I can say that, you know, with this roundtable and these people um, uh, and my esteemed colleagues um, around me, that the Internet is not a monoculture. It's a rich variety of subcultures that engage with anonymity in diverse ways. Um, I think we all know aliases and pen names um, are not new concepts. Um, people have historically contributed to public debate under pseudonyms and are continue, continuing to do so um, even to this day. Um, posting anonymously also can allow people to protect themselves so that they can openly discuss and deal with some of these complex issues and topics safely. Also, we want to make sure that people can speak out about abuse and seek information. So from these concepts and these principles, the ability to use a pseudonym has been a core tenet of Twitter service since its inception. This was actually a feature that was built in consultation with a number of human rights groups and dissidents who rely on our service to speak truth to power. And in many ways, we think that people's lives would be at risk if they were not able to post anonymously. Um, and this includes human rights defenders, dissidents, whistleblowers, journalists, artists, people of certain faiths, and many others. So at Twitter, when we do have people create a new account, our users do have to provide a verified phone number or email address when signing up. And this means that police could access this data about an account, even if someone has a pseudonym. So if there's at risk issues, if there's um, threats to you know, physical harm, to violence, um, that's when we're able to work with authorities in that situation to make sure that we're able to protect people. But at Twitter, we're also looking at focusing on behavior, not just content itself. So that means regardless of whether you're using your real name, you cannot circumvent the rules and the terms of service that we have in place. It's against the rules to have a fake account on Twitter. And pseudonymity, as we said before, is not a shield to our terms of service. So we will take action against accounts that are in violation of these rules. We're working really hard to ensure that there's removal of illegal content, but also while balancing the need to protect freedom of expression. Our teams, of course, duly review legal requests that we receive, including here in Australia. But one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we were pulling out in this debate is that there's deeper questions around rights to privacy, expression and association. There's a significant tension with privacy and data security. And we, one of the questions that we keep asking and having come up is if we wanna normalize people sharing sensitive IDs, documents routinely in these regards. Also, we know that companies that store personal information for business purposes can expose people to potential serious risks, especially when that information could be leaked or data breach occurs. The second point that I had brought up um, was around empirical evidence pointing to anonymity bans being ineffective. One of the things that we've seen, um, and I'll use um, a specific case example out of South Korea, is in 2004, there was actually um, uh, the government imposed the law requiring users to provide their national identification numbers before posting on election related websites in an effort to curb any sort of election misinformation. Um, we actually saw that studies, though, during this time when this policy was in operation, um, was that there was no significant decrease in online abuse. In fact, the Korean Communications Commission, Commission found that the hateful comments decreased by less than 1% um, in the first year when the policy was in force. So the policy didn't appear to have prevented the spread of misinformation or conspiracy theories either. And what did in fact happen was um, there was a breach of 35 million South Koreans national identification numbers that was stolen. So this law was actually repealed um, in 2012 and was something that was found um, to uh, chip away and erode at those freedoms. Um, as you know, 
um, many of our partners are going to highlight um, some of the issues that are faced by specific communities today. But I do think that it's important to um, highlight that if you're a young person exploring your sexuality, if you're a victim of domestic violence, and you're looking for online help and support, pseudonymity is a really important safety tool for you. We've seen that pseudonymity can also be used by whistleblowers seeking ways to tell the truth about government or inst institutional corruption, like um, here in Australia, we saw that with Witness K. Um, we also know that many of the first voices that have spoke out about societal wrongdoings on Twitter have done so behind some degree of pseudonymity. Um, anonymous speech is usually how the public finds out about the depth and severity of challenges being faced, um, like abuses of power or even uh, the severity of the global pandemic that we've all been living through over the past two years. So we believe that the removal of anonymity could be a barrier to also um, letting people uh, be who they truly are online. Um, having done some consultation here with groups in Australia, we found that this actually applies to the Australians trans community and issues regarding um, uh, problems around birth certificates and access to updated government IDs. So this is just one example of the community that we're striving to give a voice to on Twitter. Another issue that we've done with some of this is also looking at gender and race-based harassment. And it's only possible if people know a person's gender or race and real names can give strong indications about both those categories. So sometimes requiring people to disclose that information forces those risks upon them. I know I'm at time, so I will wrap up with um, just my last quick point that we think these principles eroding the principles of anonymity could stifle free speech and democratic debate. Um, as some of you may know, we did release our open internet position paper last month where we highlighted the need to balance tackling harm while protecting the global internet. And we were offering up some of these principles to inform the public policy debate and scrutinize issues around content moderation, things like anonymity, but also the role of responsibilities of services like Twitter. We need to make sure that we're really changing our approach to the question about should we force real names in online communities. I, I want to emphasize, I cannot emphasize this enough, a tech solution cannot fix a social problem. The concerns around anonymity in this current debate have been oversimplified and system design changes cannot solve social problems without actual social change. It's not clear that anonymity is the primary driver of abusive and antisocial behavior online. It's even less clear that requiring government identification for social media would do anything to fix the situation. I think it's imperative that everyone is equipped with the right tools and information to uphold their digital rights. And regulations and laws must enshrine those rights, not privatize the critical role of the state. So thank you for listening to my um, quick points. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Peter um, uh, to speak. Over to you, Peter. Great. Thank, thanks very much, Cara. Um, of course, I speak for the Alliance for Journalist Freedom, and I'm uh, the UNESCO Chair in Journalism and Communication at, the, at uh, the University of Queensland. So the issues that concern me really deal with anonymity and journalism. Now, there are really two parts to this issue for, for journalists. And the first one, and the thing that I think concerns us most, is um, the ability of journalists to protect sources. And of course, the importance of, of whistleblowers being able to speak confidentially to journalists is very, very well established in law. That, that's why we have shield laws. Um, the problem is that those shield laws, and of course, well, just to be clear, the shield laws allow, allow journalists to refuse to identify their sources in court um, on, under the protection of press freedom. Now, of course, those shield laws become utterly meaningless. Its point becomes per its purpose becomes pointless if elsewhere law enforcement agencies in the state are able to access um, the, the, those sources through other means, even before the case can ever get to court. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those issues uh, shortly. Um, what we've seen in recent years since 9-11 is the ability of journalists to protect their sources being undermined by all sorts of overreaching national security powers and legislation to the point now where it's pretty much impossible to protect sources. Um, government agencies can hack into any communications without, without us knowing. Now, as Cara just mentioned, uh, people you know, will be aware of, of Witness K and Bernard Caleri and their role in exposing um, the espionage that the Australian government undertook in, in sensitive negotiations with East Timor. Um, there's the Defence Forces lawyer, David McBride, who admitted sending documents with evidence of war crimes by Australian Special Forces to the ABC. Uh, we know from our own research 
at the University of Queensland that um, even though it's impossible to quantify the number of stories that aren't being told because of the erosion of um, that kind of anonymity, because of the inability of journalists to protect their sources, we know that a lot of stories are being withdrawn. A lot of sources are drying up. Journalists are shutting down stories because they simply can't get access to, 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 to whistleblowers uh, or because they can't, um, they can't guarantee their, their identity is protected. Now, generally, we believe that journalists themselves should be identified and linked to their stories. That's accountability is a key part of how we separate journalism from the stuff that looks like journalism online but doesn't really meet those journalistic standards. But we also recognise that there are always going to be circumstances where journalists' identities need to be protected. And I can think of a whole host of examples. Journalists in Afghanistan, for example, uh, who are reporting on abuses by the Taliban. Um, Uyghur journalists reporting on the Chinese government's crackdown in Xinjiang. Or as Al Jazeera did in Egypt, they kept the names of their journalists off air when the government was accusing foreign reporters of undermining national security in, this, in the process. Um, really riling up the public and, and exposing any journalist who went out and identified themselves in public to enormous amount of, of anger and resentment and sometimes attack. And so we, we know and understand that there are times when journalists need to be, journalist identities need to be protected. Overall, though, what remains important is the ability for journalists to protect their sources. And of course, in Australia, what we've seen are three particularly concerning pieces of legislation that make anonymity almost impossible. Um, in fact, functionally impossible. In, um, and in fact, in that process, they violate the conditions that David spoke of a few moments ago with regard to Article 19, the limitations um, on the state um, overextending its power and undermining freedom of expression, and crucially, of course, to me, the impact that they have on press freedom. There's the Telecommunications Interception and Access Amendment or the Metadata Retention Bill from 2015. That compels telecoms companies to keep metadata for at least two years and it gives intelligence agencies the ability to access that metadata without a warrant. Um, for the only exception, of course, is for journalists. Um, but uh, those hearings to hear, to, to hear warrants uh, for, for the investigations into journalist metadata take place in secret. There's no ability for us to, to, in, to um, monitor those. We can't, the journalists aren't allowed to contest those hearings. And we know from a report by the Telecommunications Alliance uh, from 2019 that the security agencies that access metadata almost 300,000 times in one 12 month period. Um, and on 60 occasions, they dug into the metadata of journalists. Um, and when you think about the reasons that the authorities might want to investigate metadata of journalists, it's hard to imagine why they would need to do it almost a thousand times a day. Um, it's hard to understand that that would necessarily be due to national security. Um, of course, this, this was sold to us as a piece of national security legislation. And, and when you understand the extent of those incursions, you really do start to wonder why they need that level of access, particularly in a, in a bill that was sold to us as a piece of national security legislation. If there's the Toller Act of 2018, which the Telecommunications Assistance and Access Act. Now that allows law enforcement and intelligence agencies to request and compel technology companies and communication providers to do rather ambiguously certain acts or things in order to enable those agencies to access communications. And I know this, is, this will be something that Twitter is particularly concerned about. Um, and this, that, that involves, in theory, um, building in weaknesses or vulnerabilities into encrypted communications so that the telecoms providers can can um, can comply with those those uh, those warrants. And most recently, there's the surveillance legislation amendment bill, which is otherwise known as identify and disrupt, which creates three new types of warrants that give the AFP and the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission the power to access and change data on any of your digital devices. Now, all of this is particularly concerning, but I guess the thing that really, that we also need to re recognize is that in Australia in particular, we've got no constitutional protection for press freedom or freedom of speech. We, we simply don't have the kinds of legal and, and constitutional backstops that exist in other countries like the United States with the First Amendment or the UK 
with um, its um, Bill of Rights that fundamentally provide a restraint on on governments and and give give it citizens give citizens um, a, a basic fundamental right to to freedom of expression and freedom of the press. And I think for those reasons in Australia we need to be particularly concerned about this. The, the simple fact is that we're seeing press freedom and freedom of speech eroded. Um, the very existence of these laws, of course, means that even if we don't see people being arrested and, and, and imprisoned, um, those the existence of those laws still has uh, a very clear and demonstrable chilling effect on press freedom and freedom of speech. Thanks, Peter. Um, the next speaker that we'll be handing over to is Lucy over at Digital Rights Watch. Over to you, Lucy. Thanks, and I apologize ahead of time if I cough, I'm a little bit sick, but thank you everybody for joining us um, today for this little uh, briefing. As Carl mentioned, I'm the Executive Director of Digital Rights Watch, and prior to taking that post on, I spent um, five years at Access Now, which is another digital rights um, sort of group working at the global level. So I've seen, I think I've had plenty of experience with activists, dissidents, uh, journalists. Um, I've done trainings, um, you know, to protect anonymity and and um, and sort of uh, the integrity of, of their sources. Um, and, and, you know, I've seen firsthand, I think, the impact that a lack of anonymity has on at-risk groups. Um, and I think it's very easy when we sort of dish that list out of, of these categories to think that, that they are somehow a minority, um, that, you know, political dissidents or activists um, or, or journalists are, are somehow a few, uh, a small number, I think, globally. But realistically, the, this is, you know, categories of hundreds of thousands of people in certain countries, millions of people in certain countries that criminalize um, certain religions or sexual orientations. These are hundreds of thousands of people that we refer to. Um, so I think it's critical to not just um, get stuck on these categories as being representative of something that we might perceive as a small minority. Um, and I guess one of the, at Digital Rights Watch, we kind of go at length about why anonymity is important um, and, and sort of leaning back on the framework that David really uh, wonderfully introduced earlier. Um, but I actually wanted to share a little bit of my own experience um, with why I have found anonymity to be important and sort of what prompted my career in digital rights, if you will, um, and what sort of um, people always say, what is the, for, you know, what is the moment um, that sort of uh, turned you into an activist? And for me, <laughs> that was when I was 16 um, and I had moved to Kuwait um, and I had come from, uh, uh, you know, a very liberal, <laughs> sort of a place in Prague, uh, in Czech Republic, where I was in high school. Um, and it was uh, the year of 2006. So a lot of um, the internet was just kind of kicking off. We had MySpace, we had Facebook, um, you know, we had Wikimedia. It was, I think, what people somewhat sentimentally now refer to as the era of forums <laughs> and sort of online chat rooms. Um, and so that was already really important to me. Um, I remember as a teen, but when I moved to uh, Kuwait, it became a critical sort of lifeline because I was pulled out of, uh, you know, I, I can't even describe the cultural shock that going from Europe um, to, to a Gulf country has on a, on a teenager <laughs> with pink hair, but it was um, dramatic. And so it really, that was my only link to community. It was my only link to my friends um, and my base. And also as a member of the LGBTQ community, um, you know, going to a place and a country that um, not only stigmatizes that, but criminalizes that. That was a really critical um, sort of lifeline for me. Um, and so the first thing that happened was that um, my Facebook got blocked, then my MySpace got blocked, then everything else got blocked. And I was basically taken off um, the internet by the Kuwaiti authorities. Um, we received some letters about moral um uh, you know, uh, just um, the more we have, I've basically offended the morals of the state um, with the things that I was looking up and communicating about. And obviously at the time I was privileged enough to have diplomatic um, sort of exemptions from, from these laws. So I, in my bus, <laughs> made a huge mess um, of things and we submitted documents and it became a, a really big sort of deal. 
um, that I'm sure my mom had the pleasure of dealing with at a level I didn't see at the time. Um, but, you know, to me, um, this, the reason I share this is um, I, I'm concerned about, at the time I was concerned about what happens to people who don't have that privilege and immunity, who aren't able to force their way back into those communities um, and, and those sort of ties and, and things that hold their lives together. Um, and what, of, what happens to everyone else who is just living in these countries um, that find, you know, that do put something as out as morally reprehensible or do create these sort of rules and guidelines around what you should be thinking, how you should be acting, what religion you should subscribe to. Um, you know, maybe you should be heteronormative, maybe you should be this. Um, and they really actually criminalize any deviation from that, uh, from that norm. And for, I think at the time I didn't quite, at the time I was just upset. And the moment I got my community back, things bounced back for me, but with more reflection, I realized just how critical that was. And if I had remained isolated, how incredibly impactful that would have been on my own um, development and ability um, um, to integrate socially. And so for me, when I uh, you know, think about <laughs> protecting anonymity, it really speaks to the core of like young kids being able to find themselves, but also adults being able um, to find their ideas. And what David said, you know, and Cara have highlighted um, about this just being an integral part of democracy and the exploration of ideas. Um, and I think increasingly, we're not able to do that. Increasingly, people self-censor because things are so tied um, to their identities online. And I, I worry that the, the, the approach that the Australian government is taking is actually just incredibly reckless. It, it's not just bad policy, it's, it's reckless. And I think also in terms of thinking of the international system and the role that my diplomatic immunity played at the time, um, you know, Australia needs to have a serious think about the system that it's putting out into the world. Because increasingly I see Australia's policies mentioned in paperwork in Europe and in the US. And I really worry about the repercussions that this is gonna have. That is not to say that people in Australia feel protected or safe. I think there's plenty of people, victims of domestic violence, whistleblowers, um, you know, minority uh, groups of all kinds, um, Aboriginal folks, everybody um, I think would beg to differ. Um, but in particular, um, I think these groups are at risk. So I think I will leave it there before I run over time, but I just wanted to share um, that that's, you know, there are very real um, people who are harmed by these policies and they are members of my community. They're people I work with. And um, it's not just a short list of sort of groups that I named at the beginning. It's not just journalists and political. These are hundreds of thousands of people um, that we are fundamentally cutting off from knowledge and the ability to develop and, and think critically. Thank you so much, Lucy, for sharing that with us. Um, actually, it's a natural segue to our next speaker, who's Adrian Murdoch from Minus 18. And he's going to have a facilitated um, quick conversation with our lead for Twitter for Good, Talia. So over to you, Talia and Adrian. Thanks so much, Kara, and thank you for everyone who's shared so far. Um, my name's Talia, my pronouns are she and her, and um, I'm a member of the public policy team for Australia and New Zealand, focusing on a portfolio that we call Twitter for Good. Uh, Twitter for Good brings our company and community together in areas including civil liberties, crisis response, equality, internet safety and the environment. Um, and I'm joined by Adrian today from Minus 18, who we've been really lucky to work with over the years on promoting online safety and amplifying the voices of LGBTQIA plus youth. Adrian, I'll let you introduce yourself in a little bit about Minus 18 for those who aren't familiar with your work. Um, and then we'll dive into it, a bit of a QA and a as well about the role that anonymity and pseudonymity can play for this community. So yeah, absolutely. Hi, I'm Adrian. I use he and they pronouns. Um, and as Talia said, I work at Minus 18. If you're not familiar, we're a youth-driven charity for LGBTQ plus young people. So we run uh, events, both digitally and in person, uh, campaigns, education and workshops all across Australia. Um, our primary cohort is working with queer young people at age um, 12 to 19. So it's really exciting to sort of take this lens because I think there are some really interesting parallels. And thank you, Lucy, for sharing so candidly, you know, your experience and sort of like 
understanding, I guess, you know, vulnerable communities and marginalized communities, how they can use anonymity or pseudonyms to, to feel safe online. Um, it's really prevalent as well in the LGBTQA plus community, especially for young people who are sort of growing in that space and discovering their identities and looking for connection as well. Well, that might just start us off. <laughs> My first question was was quite broad in that what role can online anonymity play for LGBTQIA plus use? Yeah, so I think for um, LGBTQIA plus or queer young people, and for any young person as a whole, the internet can be a really intimidating place. Um, so growing up, you know, if you're marginalised um, or um, from a, a small community, you know, you're really open to, unfortunately, cyberbullying, which is really tricky to combat. And because, you know, in terms of bullies often being anonymous as well, which is a weird conundrum in this space, it also does help to provide um, LGBTQ plus young people accessing connection or resources online privacy because um, a report in 2017 showed that two in five queer young people are bullied online. So being able to access a space where you can have that privacy, I think is really um, a way and a tool to sort of protect yourself. Um, and that's not just online, but also in real life, I think for, a queer young person who might be trying to connect to friends, they might be in a volatile or unsafe home environment, or there's risks at school being outed. So having that privacy to sort of connect with people um, through anonymity is really important to, to make sure you've got that kind of equal access to kind of that connection and support and that peer support, which I think is the most important, you know, being online is that you can connect to someone else who is LGBTQ plus if you're from a regional rural community, um, or if you're someone who is LGBTQ plus and, you know, might have an intersecting identity as someone who is culturally diverse um, or First Nations, you know, you might be that only person in a whole town. So you can connect with someone, you know, in another state who can understand and empathise with what you're going through because they're going through it too. So I think that anonymity does really help to kind of just um, propel young people to have that peer support, which, you know, for um, anyone who might be cis or heterosexual, you might more easily be able to access. Well, that really plays well into my next question as well. Um, I was wondering, you touched a little bit around the volatile or unsafe uh, real world environments people might be in. Um, but I was just wondering, what do you think the the main reasons that youth might remain anonymous while they're building community with other potentially queer or other young people online? Yeah, I think, you know, as I sort of touched on, there's that, like, ability to control, you know, what information is sort of shared out there. Um, but I think as well, it's sort of the ability to explore this, um, you know, in terms of your sexuality or gender identity in a way that doesn't, you know, ironically place you in a binary of itself. Um, a lot of LGBTQ plus young people identify as pansexual and non-binary and, and gender diverse um, in their teen years. And I think those um, identities give young people that freedom to sort of explore and kind of have that space to kind of better understand, you know, um, how they identify. And, you know, that could be an identity that remains for their entire life or, you know, from that it might lead them to sort of like identifying as being gay or lesbian or trans. And I think as a teenager, you know, to, to come out is often sort of like a label that can be really hard to sort of like shake off if you sort of like, if that changes or it evolves. So I think anonymity, anonymity gives people that ability to explore that, um, explore that safely. And I think on abundance of, you know, different social media platforms too and different sort of like subcultures, you know, be it um, social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, as Lucy mentioned, forums, um, you know, that that ability to kind of um, find, you know, a community that really reflects your values too, um, which can take a bit of time. You know, you might go onto a Facebook group and it sort of um, doesn't reflect, I guess, you know, your own lived experience or what your values are. So if you can um, use anonymity to eventually find a group where you can really gel and really connect and feel safe and then you know you can kind of make that distinction of sort of like hey these are my people this is sort of like a place where I do want to share a little bit about myself in a safe way and over time. And I just have one more question thank you so much um, 
how prevalent do you actually you at minus 18 you work with so many young people uh how prevalent do you actually think online anonymity and pseudonymity is for rainbow use yeah i think the um the big shift that we saw was COVID-19 we're all familiar you know for us we do in-person events we always have for the last 20 years for LGBT gay plus young people um we're based largely in Melbourne um so we spent a lot of time in lockdown but unfortunately so did LGBT gay plus young people in Melbourne too so uh about two months into the pandemic we made that shift to digital events um and you know we didn't know what to expect and how young people might engage with that space um, but it was so hugely successful. We still had hundreds of young people still come into that space. Um, we still saw the same um, levels of evaluation when we compared uh, in-person events to digital events and the fact that 75% uh, of our attendees would still make a friend online as they would in person. 99% um, felt safe in that space which was higher than in-person events. 99% um, felt connected to community. So it was amazing to see that, you know, what we might make of an assumption in terms of an in-person event versus a digital event um, was actually completely sort of flipped, that actually that was quite higher. Um, and I think that really reflects the, you know, ecosystem of, you know, to go to an in-person event means that you have to travel all the way there. You might have to tell your parents about where you're going. You know, you might see a friend in that in that venue or at that event. And so it actually removes a lot of things that might traditionally made it unsafe being in person, actually makes it more safe. And so I think young people lean into that because it gives them, again, the ability to sort of register, you know, with their personal details from a youth safety perspective, but use that pseudonym in that environment, but also to kind of control, you know, um, that they can be in that environment from the safety of their bedroom, kind of build a network, build a support system, and from that feel connected to communities. So I think that prevalence will continue. And I think from a minus 18 perspective, you know, now we're specifically looking at, you know, we've got our events coordinator for in-person events, but wanting a digital events coordinator and facilitator because, you know, I think it's really shifted the narrative in a positive way that online digital spaces when done right and facilitated are just as impactful and sometimes even more so. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing today and for all of the amazing work that you do at Minus 18. Thanks, thanks, thanks Adrian. Thanks, Talia. Um, so last but definitely not least, um, we have Dr. Emily Vandernagel um, from Monash University who will speak and then we'll move into our open Q&A. Over to you, Emily. Thank you so much um, for inviting me today. My name is Emily Vandernagel and I'm speaking today from my role as lecturer in social media at Monash University. Um, I've been researching social media anonymity and pseudonymity for the past decade. My own PhD thesis is really a long form rebuttal to this idea we've already canvassed today that anonymity equals malicious intent in a straightforward way. So I've popped a link in the chat to some of my writing on this. I'm really happy to you know, um, to, to share that more broadly with you. I wanted to start today by pointing to a an, on, an online phenomenon you might have heard of, the Finster, okay? When we talk about the fake Instagram account, it isn't really fake at all. It's an alternative Instagram account. It's one with a smaller audience than somebody's main Instagram presence. And the purpose of a Finsta is to cultivate intimacy with close friends, um, often through candid or silly or fun posts, while the main account displays posts and images that are suitable for a wider public. The Finster and on Twitter, the alt account is a pseudonymity practice. It's a way of negotiating a platform by using a name that isn't recognized as somebody's primary identifier. So I'd like to build on what, um, what others in this session have already said by pointing out that the username is a key part of interactions between people and platforms and that using a real name is not as straightforward for a lot of people online. Separating real names from social media profiles and usernames is an essential strategy for compartmentalizing context 
and for getting the most out of social media. So we've already covered today that anonymity on the internet is often framed as the terrain of troublemakers and trolls. It's a reason for incivility, harassment, misinformation, and these, as we know, are wicked problems to solve. Um, but we also understand too that the abuse that hits the hardest is not really likely to be like a rude or even a threatening tweet or message from a stranger. It comes from people that we already know and trust. And we only have to spend a short time on Facebook or other platforms where people um, have particular names to know that being mean, being rude, being harassing is not just something that happens under the cover of anonymity. And for me, the question of motivation, it's not even really the most pressing one. We know why people troll and harass. Um, if you ask them, they give the same responses time and time again. It's fun. It gets attention, gives people a sense of power and control. Um, there are broader questions to, to ask there about where cruelty comes from and why people feel like they don't have enough agency in their own lives. So if I take this core argument that anonymity and pseudonymity are critical aspects of our platformed lives, um, this also builds into much older ideas that we have about names. Um, and the way that pseudonymity allows for meaningful connections on social media. It helps people foster creativity, playfulness and intimacy among compartmentalised audiences. We know that search engines, social media platforms um, and the way that we log in and experience the internet more broadly is most often done through commercially owned platforms uh, and they portray human beings who are messy and inconsistent and constantly changing as data profiles. And this has damaging consequences for our privacy, our freedom and our selfhood. I wanted to share with you something that a research participant has said to me uh, in my co-authored book, Sex and Social Media, I spoke with a lot of people about how they organise those public and private facets, facets of their identities, especially when it came to really intimate parts of ourselves, those, those things like sexual identities, nude selfies um, and, and intimate connections. And one of my research participants, Victoria, was talking to me about her private Instagram account. She said this account has something like just 24 followers. She said, this is a mixture of very close real life friends and a couple of people from Twitter because Twitter used to be my space, you know, where I could talk about whatever I wanted, but then it got to a certain size and you have to sanitize it. I find a tricky push and pull sometimes between the person who I want to be and what I think the world should be okay with. Will people adversely judge me? It's a continuous back and forth negotiation. We know through research that choosing your own name is a powerful act that gives us agency in our relationship to our social world. Names are fundamental to how we identify and represent ourselves, and they even have the potential to signal which audience we're communicating to. Um, there are so many dynamics between the full name, the nickname, the stage name, or even no name at all, and how they contribute to communicative contexts. Um, we've heard in this session already about the, the importance of the pen name and how this extends to a history well, well before the internet. And, you know, like there are so many examples, just one from literature is the mathematician Charles Dodgson, who wrote children's books under his pen name, Lewis Carroll. And now with search engines in the picture, names can determine how we're searched for and how we are found online. My own name is Emily Vandenagel. It only returns Google results for one person, and that's me. The John and Jane Smiths of the world have a different experience with social media and with search engines, along with all kinds of periods of flux with our names, married names, post-transition names, an anglicised name after somebody moves country. Just a few examples. For those posting to social media, being able to be anonymous or pseudonymous allows them to choose their identities, audiences and context in a way that gives them something we know is important, which is agency and control over their sense of self.
We've heard today that not everybody is safe when they use the name on their official identification documents to identify who they are in, in particular contexts. As others on this roundtable have raised, you know, some people are still figuring out their queer identity. They're seeking information about a sensitive topic like safe sex. They're trying to escape an abusive relationship, blow the whistle on corruption or report on these many complexities. These people aren't doing something wrong, but they need the room to reach certain kinds of conversations and communities without being publicly visible. And I wanna close here by drawing our attention, not, not just to the harm that people do and the harm they avoid by being anonymous online, but to the joy that's possible under these conditions. Lucy and Adrian have already mentioned the importance of finding communities where we belong. These can be affirming and joyful. And as part of a social media audience, somebody following, browsing, reading, finding anonymous content can lead to surprising and illuminating perspectives. Um, you know, how many of us have, have found relatable memes or been absorbed in some kind of intimate family drama from a Reddit post? Now there's more research to be done in this space. We still need to know what platforms can do to balance identity verification with pe giving people the freedom to be themselves. We would benefit from hearing from you know, people who are always, sometimes never anonymous, but for now, we know that real name policies and mandatory identi identity verification, they don't make the internet safer or kinder. Instead, they damage attempts to contextualize our communication, forge the kinds of connections that matter on social media and get in the way of us experiencing the kind of joy that's possible in these spaces. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, that was extraordinary. I feel like with these topics, we could have gone on for hours and hours and um, wish we had a bit more time. But um, as promised, I wanted to open this up to um, any questions from journalists. So have an open floor.